So my name is Thierry Carrez, I'm the release manager for the OpenStack project and this talk will be about a quick introduction on OpenStack followed by a NetXC containers integration demo by Chuck Short. Thanks. Okay. So just a few words on the project genesis. Um, the, on one hand you had Rackspace hosting. Rackspace runs the Rackspace Cloud, uh, an alternative to Amazon's web services, and it was made of cloud servers and cloud files. And they wanted to rewrite cloud servers and also wanted to open source the whole software infrastructure that they were using. On the other hand, you had a team at NASA who was working on uh, writing an open source um, cloud computing platform, and they released it with an early release as a Nova CC, Apache licensed. And some people saw potential for convergence between the two projects. It was actually the same type of architecture, it was uh, both written in Python. So they discussed with each other and they came up with the idea of the OpenStack project, which takes the code from Nova and the code from Cloud Files and uh, make it the two core components of OpenStack. Just a quick mission statement. The mission statement of the OpenStack project is to produce an ubiquitous open source cloud computing platform that will meet the needs of public and private cloud providers regardless of size by being simple to implement and massively scalable. Okay. We based it on four basic principles. One is open source. Uh, it's Apache licensed. It's uh, fully open source, there is no proprietary code. It's open design, we are having an OpenStack design summit uh, under the model of UDS. Uh, anyone can submit a blueprint and propose a feature. We have open development. Um, anyone can propose a branch for merging and code reviews happen in the open. We have open community, we have community elected project technical leads, we have uh, community elected members of the project policy board. One thing to keep in mind though is that it's a very young project. Since the inception of OpenStack, uh, it's been less than a year. We have had three releases. Uh, we, have our, we have had our third design summit like two weeks ago in California. And although it's a young project, it has attracted a lot of attention. We have uh, about 90 developers having committed code to um, the three core projects we have now. But this picture is not the regular OpenStack partner picture. It's actually companies that have developers on payroll contributing code to, uh, to the OpenStack core project. So there are a few uh, known names in there. OpenStack project. So I was mentioning three core OpenStack projects. That is OpenStack object storage, the name Swift. OpenStack Image Registry and Delivery, codenamed Glance, and OpenStack Compute, codenamed Nova. But we also have a lot of projects coming down the pipe, and that may become core projects in the future. We have a queue service, uh, codenamed Burrow. We have a web UI named Dashboard. We have a common authentication service coming up for all the core projects that is called Keystone. We're planning to separate the network part of the network services of Nova into a set of separate projects, that is uh, Quantum, Melange, and Donabe. And if you're interested in that, you can talk to Rick Clark from Cisco here. Wave. We also plan to separate the block storage, the volume management, and that's a project called Lunar. And we also have other projects like Database as a Service, Load Balancing as a Service. It's more in incubation mode currently. So more, uh, look, let's have a look more deeper into Nova. Nova is the cloud compute part. You could think of it as VMs being just one API call away. It's a highly modular framework, so you have to pick the components you actually want to deploy. It's, uh, there is lots of different deployment options. We support the EC2 API and our own uh, OpenStack API. It's still under heavy development, and especially the, the network and volume separation part uh, will happen during this cycle. Quick look on the different components. One thing to keep in mind is that you can run any number of those, uh, any number of instances of each of those nodes. 
uh, to handle the uh, handle the load or uh, to scale up. So we have the API node that handles the client request. We have the scheduler node that decides on which uh, compute node the request will be handled. We have compute nodes that actually run the VMs. We have network nodes that provide network services to those VMs. And we have volume nodes that handle the block storage. Um, I won't go into detail on this slide. It shows the, the different uh, modularity, the di different ways you can deploy OpenStack. Just have a look at the compute node. We support QML, KVM, UML, LXSYS, we libvirt. We support, also support open source Zen, Zen Server, Hyper-V, and uh, VMware vSphere. How to test it? Um, so we're, we're actually using Ubuntu Server as our reference development platform. We are developing against the next version of Ubuntu. The last release, code name Cactus, was um, released in Natty Universe. We have daily build PPAs for Onere, Natty, Maverick, Lucid. We have also have for those that don't want to leave too much in the bleeding edge, we have Milestone and release PPAs. And we support all-in-one installs for developers. You can actually install all the components on a single machine and, and test it using those two commands. The future. So we decided two weeks ago at the Design Summit to change the release schedule. We used to do a three months, three months cadence. And in fact, we'll have each project moving to a half months, monthly milestones. And every six months, we'll have a coordinated release of all the core projects that is aligned with, with the Ubuntu cycle. So the next release is called uh, Diablo, and it will be released on, the final release will be on September 22. The feature list is still being discussed. Uh, it's still work in progress, but we already know that we'll have, we'll try to have distributed scheduling, boot from volumes, um, separate the volumes and network APIs, and support for OpenVZ. So uh, come and join the fund. There are a few URLs for you here, Google RMC channels, and, and the mailing list, and others. Yes. Demo. I can take a few questions while, while Chuck sets up. So I'm here to demo LXE containers under OpenStack. It's a relatively new feature for, uh, for OpenStack. Um, basically, how it works is it uses a libvirt driver for LXE to drive the LXE container when you run it OpenStack. So I'm going to run a quick demo. You see that? Where are you sitting from? Let's see. <laughs> so, this is running on my, on my machine at home. It's an AMD 64 machine. Uh, so, great thing about Linux uh, LC containers is you can run on very small uh, machines. So, when I was traveling to Budapest, I was running on this Intel Atom. Um, so I can do some testing while I was on the airplane. Um, and it can run on anything that basically LXC supports. So uh, one of our best sessions this week was to run uh, Buddhist over an ARM. So this would be our, our uh, choice to, OpenStack would be our choice for a cloud solution on ARM. 
So I'm, so I don't have much time, so I'm, I take the liberty of uploading an image to my local OpenStack installation. Uh, it uses the same commands as Eucalyptus. So. Right. You can see here there's so you can see there's it has the same <coughs> interface as Eucalyptus does. So uh, there's you have buckets, you have images. And you have quarters as well. Okay. So right now, I was going to run an image. So why don't I explain how it works? So basically what it does is when you run Yuko run instances, you pass a key, uh, which you created beforehand. It basically calls the libbrick driver to basically create a container for you. So it runs, it basically mounts the image, injects the keys that you, you asked for, and it basically then unmounts it again, then it creates a loopback device and basically mounts the image. So maybe I have a D. All right. There we go. It's still a young project, as Terry said. So, in theory, when you look at the Nova Compute log file, it tells you what's happening. So, basically, it will mount the image, inject the keys, and basically, it runs the instance. And when you, after the instance runs, you can see, uh, if you use rar sh, you can see the instance running. So, um, but due to a bug in Cloud Linux, there's some still issues running with LC containers on Natty, so that will be fixed in there. So, does anyone have any questions or? No? Um, there should be some libric processes at the top, maybe? Um, if there if there if there is a continuous, continuous running, there would be a little bit of process running basically. Uh, so you can have you can see you can see that basically the continuous running. So you should be able to see as well the, the if it's running with LXC, you should be able to see as well the processes inside the machine, right? Right. You should if it's if we didn't have. Uh, for those problems, you would see the you would see the process running with LC. Right, which is which is I think what, what's what's really interesting about that is that we we exactly in the same process space we're 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 seeing the 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 machine that we're running the virtual machine actually um, actually working right. Yeah, it's it, it will have a, another level of, of interaction. We'll have another another um, another 
layer which which creates uh, uh, more more load for the machine. Right. And that would actually work even within a virtualized environment like Amazon, mm -hmm. which is which is pretty interesting. Yeah, I've written a blog post about getting OpenStack written on uh, Amazon EC2 as well. So, LXC is meant to be tubes uh, which are more secure, uh, but I understand that uh, our current LXC implementation isn't necessarily totally safe. Uh, is there any work that's going into this cycle to help harden LXC support in OpenStack? Yes, there's, there's talk of doing sandboxing with containers, so you have a a kernel interface which prevents logging from like breaking out of the, the LXC container. If you okay, so if anyone has any questions, come and see me after. Says everything will be okay. Right. There so, hello, my name is Matthew Thomas. I'm a designer at Canonical, and I'd like to read you a poem. I keep six honest serving men, they taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. Let's start with why. Ubuntu is a grand experiment. Ubuntu was founded in an attempt to answer the question, is it possible for an open source model to scale to an entire operating system? An operating system used not just by tens of thousands of people, but by hundreds of millions of people. Well, now we know the answer to that question, and the answer is yes. <laughs> right now, Android is not the most popular mobile operating system. It's not even the most popular phone operating system. But it is used by tens of millions of people, and the reason Lanaro is doing so much work on it is that tens of millions more users are on their way. And to the extent that Android remains open source, I believe it makes the world a better place. I believe Ubuntu makes the world a better place too. But what Ubuntu is doing is much harder. Android is in a, a relatively new market, the market for phones that don't suck. But <laughs> the PC market, on the other hand, is old. We are challenging a hugely dominant competitor that has been around for a long time. A lot of people think this is impossible, that we can't ever win. But in the software industry, it has happened before. Lotus 123 overtook VisiCalc. Microsoft Excel overtook Lotus 123. Word overtook WordPerfect. Internet Explorer overtook Netscape. And most recently, Adobe InDesign overtook Quark Express. Now you've probably noticed that three of these examples are from Microsoft. But fortunately, the Microsoft of today is very different from the Microsoft of 20 years ago. They've forgotten a lot of what they knew about competing. So how did these upstarts win against the dominant players? Each of them did three things. First, they made a better product. Many people think that's enough by itself but usually it isn't. Second, they reduced barriers to migration. And third, they waited for the dominant player to make a mistake. In every case, if you study the history, it follows these three steps. The new software is faster or easier to use or has more features or some combination of those. It reduces barriers to migration by reading and writing the old file formats, offering special help or discounts or both for switches and sometimes even letting people continue to use 
parts of the old user interface. And then the dominant player stumbles by being too slow to port to a new platform or a new architecture, or deciding to rewrite the software from scratch, or confusing their customers. So what do we need to do to apply this model to Ubuntu? Well, first we need a better product. Simple enough, right? Unfortunately, in many areas, we just don't know whether we have a better product. And where we have a fairly good idea that it's not as good yet, we don't know how much worse it is because we're not measuring it. For example, there are people at Apple who know exactly what the most common cause of crashes in Mac OS 10.6 is, and the second most common cause, and the third, and the fourth. There are people at Microsoft who know the same things about Windows 7. And with Firefox, anyone, any contributor, contributor at all can go to their website and find out what's causing the most crashes in Firefox and work out how to fix it. But as far as I know, there is nobody in the world who knows what causes the most crashes in Ubuntu 11.04. Because we don't have a real crash database, and because we don't have one, we have to turn crash reporting off on release day. There are other things that are just as bad as crashes. For example, typing control out backspace in Ubuntu used to make all your programs crash. Fortunately, people decided that it probably wasn't a good idea to have a keyboard combination that would crash all your programs. So that doesn't happen anymore. But during user testing of Ubuntu a few weeks ago, one of the participants accidentally typed control out F1. <laughs> this wasn't a crash, but it had exactly the same effect as a crash. How often does that happen in the real world? I don't know, but I think we should find out. With interface design, there are many competing goals to optimize for, but the same is true for other things as well. And you can't prioritize those goals as well if you don't have the data. Canonical has done two user tests of Unity in the past year. That is, as far as I know, two more than anyone has done on Banana Shell. But it's much less than our competitors do. Someone suggested to me last week that if I was a designer at Google, for example, I'd be frustrated by being second-guessed by them testing every design they do. But actually, I would love that. Because at heart, I'm a scientist. What I enjoy even more designing than designing things is designing things that actually work. And that means testing designs, proving them wrong, and then trying something else. There are so many other things that we should be measuring that we aren't. What percentage of people who want to try Ubuntu can get it running on a computer? We don't know. How well does Ubuntu's battery life compare with our competitors? We have a rough idea, but we don't really know. How quick is the login process on Ubuntu compared with other operating systems on the same machine? We don't know. What percentage of people can figure out how to watch a DVD on Ubuntu? We don't know. How safe is Ubuntu? We have a great security team, but safety depends also on how quickly people install security updates, and we don't know that either. So no matter who you are, no matter what you do for Ubuntu, I have two requests for you today. And the first is to ask yourself, how can I measure whether we are succeeding? If you're not measuring progress, you don't have a goal. You have a hobby. Now let's talk about something else we can measure. Applications. Ten years from now, the people who still use PCs, I think, will be people who can't do what they want with a tablet or a phone. People who really need one of these. A keyboard, a precise pointing device, or a really fast engine, a really fast processor. People like writers, editors, scientists, mathematicians, architects, engineers, pro gamers, and software developers. The good news is that these people will be a bit more like us, on average, because they'll be prepared to learn a bit about computers. They'll be the kind of people who know what a file manager is and want to use one. The kind of people who know what a web browser is and want to choose one. They'll still know and care much less about computers than most of us do, but the difference will be not quite so vast as it is now. The bad news is that very often, people in these kinds of occupations 
need to use specific applications that Ubuntu doesn't have yet. Specialized applications that are currently available only for Windows or Mac. This is partly why six months ago at the last UDS, I talked about the importance of attracting application developers. And I showed you this graph saying that Ubuntu had 2,351 applications and that the number was increasing linearly. Well, I was wrong. And the reason I was wrong was that I didn't have enough measurements. When we have more data and extend it out to Ubuntu 11.04, what we see is that over the past three years, the growth of new applications for Ubuntu is declining. Of course, the raw number of applications doesn't tell you everything, but this is a bad sign. What are we doing to fix this? Well, for a couple of years now, we've been running Ubuntu App Developer Week, which offers IRC sessions on development topics. Rick Spencer and his team are working hard on getting the Ubuntu developer site ready so that people can find out how to develop applications. Stuart Metcalf and his team are working hard on getting a submission process ready so that vendors aren't forced into Byzantine processes to make their applications available. And Ubuntu Software Center 4 has ratings and reviews so that application developers can get some idea of how well they're doing. This is a good start, but we still need to fix our proliferation of toolkits and consistent APIs, like a standard IDE and complex packaging, and figure out how, for example, we can tell developers what's coming in the next version of Ubuntu. If we can fix all of those, we might have a chance. All that just to make a better product. But remember, this is not the only thing we need to do, because we also need to reduce barriers to migration. And this is something that's really easy for someone like you, who's been using Ubuntu for years, to forget about. So the second thing I'd like you all to do today is to think about migration. For the part of Ubuntu that you work on, does an equivalent exist in Windows? If so, how easy is it to switch to the Ubuntu way? How easy is it to understand the Ubuntu way of doing things? Can you make the switch gradually? Are there settings that could be easily copied over? Things like that. So there are lots of things we need to do. Some of them can be achieved in a few weeks, while others might take years. For attracting application developers especially, many of these things can be done completely independently of the Ubuntu release cycle. And as you heard from George Gray on Monday, with Lenaro, it's impractical to plan six months out. I believe the same is true for Ubuntu as well. If we're going to catch up with our competitors, we need to get out of the mindset that something has to be done in six months if it's going to be done at all. And if we're going to achieve consumer-grade quality, we need to be do willing to do some things at longer cycles, while other things are at shorter cycles. And that means we need to learn how to propose, plan, and organize more features outside of summits, like this one. We get enormous benefits from meeting face-to-face, -face, but we shouldn't be stuck on mailing lists the rest of the time. We, should, we need voice calls, video conferences, and virtual whiteboards that increase our bandwidth more often. Whenever someone says, let's discuss this at the next UDS, I want your response to be, no, let's discuss it tomorrow. Depending on how you count, this is the 15th of the public meetings that we now call Ubuntu Developer Summits. I've been to 10 of them over the past six years. But to me, it's gotten more and more awkward to call them Developer Summits. They've never been about application development, and increasingly, they haven't been just for Ubuntu developers either. The people here are engineers, and testers, and designers, and translators, and community members, and salespeople, and writers, and artists, and managers. You are all contributors. So really, this is an Ubuntu contributor summit. I make this point because what I've learned over the past six years is that some goals are just hard. Anyone who says all Ubuntu needs now is X doesn't know what they're talking about. For some goals, you need contributors who have competence and excellence in hundreds of different areas. And that's where all of you come in. If we want Ubuntu to be a success in the future, there's a whole universe of things we need to do, and you're the ones to do it. So, Let's get back to work. Thank you.
Um, good, good afternoon. Uh, just before we. Okay. Um, so I, I, just uh, just while I'm up here, um, for, for Lenara, this has been a really uh, successful week. Uh, we've achieved a lot, and uh, I want to thank all the, the Lenara guys here. But I particularly want to thank the Canonical guys, um, all the guys behind the scenes, uh, who've done just a fantastic job in choosing this location and. Uh, putting on a great summit for us again. So uh, I'd just like to invite the Lenaro guys just to thank Canonical for uh, uh, this past week. So uh, to, just on to the, de uh, to the showcase. Um, I also have to thank our sponsors. So I've got this slide up here. Uh, they provided the funding and the, the prizes, so I'm really grateful to them. Um, the, the showcase itself on uh, Tuesday night, uh, we, we were really pleased, we thought it was a great evening, uh, there were 20 demos in the end, um, nine from uh, people inside Lenara, the various different working groups, uh, showing off what they've been doing over this past cycle. Uh, we had all of our member boards there, um, I hope people saw the, one of the first demonstrations of uh, Cortex A15 from ARM, and uh, all the other member boards. Uh, I was pleased as well that we had six uh, uh, companies from outside Lenara or um, uh, enthusiasts as well, uh, just showing how the, 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 uh, our app is starting to get picked up. Um, but uh, I know these guys are all interested to know who actually won uh, the, the prizes, so I'm going to go in reverse order. And uh, the third prize, uh, which is uh, an AR drone back here, plus uh, an STRX and Snowball uh, went or goes to Alexandros Francis and the Lenaro uh, Graphics Working Group team. Uh, are you here, Alexandros? So the thing that really caught me was the Lenaro horse. I don't know if you guys know, but if you Google for Lenaro, you'll find a horse and you'll find our company. And my ambition is that we get a lot more well-known than that horse. A short-term ambition. Okay, so the, the, the second prize, uh, which is, um, uh, again, a, an STRX and Snowball and uh, a Samsung Galaxy tablet. Uh, and this goes to the guys at uh, Open Bricks and Geeks Box. So if uh, David and Benjamin are here. <laughs> you, you can see the quality on their screens better than we've got at the moment. Uh, and then first prize, uh, so the, the nice thing is it was a clear winner, there, there, there wasn't really uh, any doubt and uh, uh, it, it was also uh, one of the clips that we used to try and advertise the event so uh, I'm, I'm really pleased and it's a guy who's been involved in uh, working with Lenaro for quite a long time now and he's doing some uh, great work in his community to uh, just uh, help spread uh, our, our name and um, uh, uh, the, the work that we're doing. So um, I'm not sure if he's here this afternoon, though. I haven't seen him. So the, the first prize winner is uh, Noritsuna Imamura from Great Music. <laughs> I should have just said that uh, the, the prize was a Samsung Galaxy tablet and $500. And just uh, last slide, uh, anything else, 
Um, we'll, we'll be following up on this next week, so if you didn't get to see all the demos, you'll hopefully see uh, a lot of them on our website, so check it out. Um, we'd really like to get some, some of the nice photos and videos that you guys took, so either send them to Michael or to our generic contact us alias on the, um, the website, and stay tuned for the next developer summit. Thanks a lot, guys.